and welcome to another episode of Healthy Perspectives. My name is Vernon Solomon. Men can have, on occasion, challenges with their mental health. This can, unfortunately, include elevated rates of substance abuse. We cannot leave alcohol out of that category either. Some of you guys may be unaware that mental health services are available for you, or you may just be hesitant about accessing those services. In this evening's episode of Healthy Perspectives, we'll be speaking with Dr. Jeff Jarosinski. Dr. Jarosinski has a master's degree in psychology and a PhD in counseling. We felt his research on emotional intelligence and depression and his work as a counselor would help shed light on some of the challenges many of us may be facing. Now, researchers are saying that there is this crisis in men's health and that there is this information to support that. I wanted to just go straight in and ask you, what would you say are some of the alarming issues or challenges, challenges that we're facing surrounding men's health, I'm mental health in particular? Mental health in particular, and I'm really pleased that it's the conversations are happening because there's a lot of opportunity. Crisis could be a strong, a strong word, or it might just be a growing awareness of the issues that are present and maybe haven't been addressed because as men we're taught to be machismo and handle this on our own and, and soldier through things. And um, now when we have more resources to address things, things that might have been kept in the closet, uh, left unaddressed, or people were left to deal with them on their own, now we've got more resources and I think we're having more conversations about, hey, how can my life be improved? Or just a general knowledge that life can improve. We don't have to struggle and um, endure a number of things where help can be available. Um, and that help can take a number of forms. We'll go through those tonight. And let's utilize those so that we can have the best lives possible uh, available for us. So you mentioned that there's progress. Why do you think that is? You mentioned awareness also, but is it just the awareness? Or as men, are we beginning to realize that we may have some challenges that need to be addressed? Yeah, I think, I think culturally, I'm raised in the United States, and so I grew up in the time with all... Uh, John Wayne, Machismo, mm -hmm. the movie stars, um, men could do things and didn't need others. And then, and there was this stigma against wearing a seat belt because, <laughs> oh, I don't need to, I'm a man. Right, and right. then they did a really good campaign in the United States about, let's be smart here. This isn't about being macho, this is about being safe. And in my life experience, that was a good transition to, okay, let's not be stupid and let's not um, hurt ourselves unnecessarily. Let's be safe and smart about things. And I think it progressed to other areas too. Uh, maybe the AIDS epidemic, mm. um, one of the welcome consequences from that was increased condom use. And so we're seeing people make smarter decisions and that can have effects for their whole lives. So I think in my experience, culture is shifting some away from the, the fierce independence, uh, the machismo uh, toward more of um, let's let's make things as good as we can. When we say mental health, that's a very broad topic. And when we use the word mental health issues or challenges, that in itself as well is a, it's a broad topic. What are you seeing in, in your practice, whether here and what you have been doing most recently or in previous practice, what are some of the, the, the main issues that you see men being faced with well, regarding let, mental health? With regard to mental health, I think it shows itself with depression the most. And depression can feed into a number of other things. When a man or anyone gets depressed, they will often try to self-medicate themselves. And so to get away from these bad feelings, they might start to drink more. They might start to use more marijuana or other drugs to try and escape these feelings. They might um, overeat. Um, they might you know, other signs, and these are signs of depression that I'm going through. If they're not getting out of bed, uh, they're not showering, they're not eating, they're losing weight, or they could be gaining weight if they uh, tend to handle their stress in that way. Things that used to give them a lot of pleasure aren't exciting for them anymore. They used to follow cricket, football, and now they're like, eh, I don't want to do that. They used to hang out with their friends, and they're, they're like, nah, I'm staying home tonight. Uh, they've got low energy, inability to concentrate. They don't have the initiative that they used to have or that they want. And so um, that depression can create a downward spiral 
where they start to drink more, well, now they might be getting in trouble at work or in school. Their performance um, tails off or they get terminated from their position, expelled from school, well, that can further exacerbate the, the depression. Uh, they're in a depression, so maybe the sexual activity isn't as interesting to them or as, as vibrant as it used to be. So that starts to affect their relationship. Uh, they tend to shut down or withdraw into their cave, so they're not communicating with their partner like they used to. That strains the relationship too, and that can uh, further fuel a downward spiral. So I think with regard to the depression, it can, and then, in a worst case scenario, it can end up in a suicide too, mm. a suicide attempt or a, com a successfully completed suicide. And so the depression can fuel a lot of other bad offshoots. The earlier we can intervene and recognize that, realize it doesn't have to be this way, and we can take some steps forward to improve that situation. You, you highlighted depression, but what's the, what do you find the underlying cause for the, the, the depression itself? Okay, great. In my opinion, I think a lot of the social isolation contributes to that. And then I think it's, a, it's an attitude, could be cultural, uh, an attitude of self-reliance, where I wanna do this, I, I should be able to do this myself, and there's uh, some weak, felt weakness or some felt shame around getting help from the outside. But isn't that what being a man is about? We're taught to be independent, mm -hmm. we're taught to rely mm -hmm. On ourselves we're, we're taught that um, but is that really the best case that's we, the question yeah we end up being a lone ranger and uh, that's hard and if you look at if you think of the ideal society you would like that if you could have the ideal society in your mind would it include those isolated men or would they be men that are vibrant and interacting and contributing to family life um, happy sexual lives and good emotional unions with uh, their partners, their children, their friends, uh, their whole family of origin. Um, I think that's the more ideal picture that would come to mind for us. So that means there has to be a support mechanism then in place, especially if it's recognized or identified that as a man I'm going through depression. What kind of support then is it that the family should be giving? Mm -hmm. Do you find that persons are belittling or may belittle the individual who is depressed? Um, they may belittle. One of the beautiful things here in Antigua and Barbuda, I think, is the good um, avenues of social support that you have. Uh, in the United States, I think the isolation for males, it's a little easier to isolate and withdraw. Even people in New York City, they talk about it's a, a city, all these millions of people, and they feel alone, mm -hmm. which is kind of paradoxical. But here you've got great social support networks. You've got people who want to party together and, and, and family. Your, your church networks are, are strong. The social networks are vibrant. Um, you see people interacting and enjoying those interactions. And there's a whole culture of enjoy life too uh, that's vibrant. And I remember my first carnival here, watching some of the elderly people <laughs> participate. I'm like, that's so great. I took a picture of one of the, one of the old men walking with the crews. I'm like, this is, this is wonderful. We don't see that so much in the United States. So I think that's one of the advantages you have here in the islands. Uh, there's a, a culture and a vibrancy and a social support. And that social support is one of the best ways to handle these stressors that we go through, whether they're normal life stressors or something pronounced and traumatic that's happened to us. That social support is what's most important. So if you're, if you're with someone and you suspect they may be going through a challenging time, you're wondering if they're depressed, let me give you some indicators that uh, you want to check into first. So the simple definition is if they can love and work, then they're pretty normal. But if this feeling blue is getting to the point where it's affecting their work, and might not just be a drop off in their production or lack of energy or concentration at work. It might be more tardy. They're tardy more at work. They're absent from work. Um, now, that's certainly going to affect their job uh, performance. And then in their relationships, are they still able to function in the relationship? Or is there a growing distance in the emotional union between them and their partners? The men want to withdraw into their cave, try and handle this by themselves, and then uh, that cost the emotional union that they should have with their partners. So if you can keep just a general definition of can they love and work, um, the way the mental health professionals say it is, is if there's significant impairment in their occupational or social functioning, then, then we want to intervene. But the, the easy way to remember that is if it's interfering with your love life or your work life, then we want to take That's some steps problem. there. 
So we, you mentioned depression, and, and I'm sorry to keep on that particular one, mm-hmm. but prevention ultimately should be the key. How do we then prevent ourselves from going down that that path of, mm-hmm. of depression or some other emotional issue that we may may end up facing? Excellent, fabulous question, and I love your emphasis on the uh, prevention because this is so important. So the best way to deal with the stresses we're going to have in our life is the social support. So we want to keep our social supports in place and our social networks vibrant. This can be a challenge, especially for older people who their friends are dying off, um, their spouse is dead. Um, and so many of the social supports that they had, uh, they can't replace a friend they had for 10 years. And uh, they might not feel like they have a lot to offer in the friendship or the, the wisdom and life experience they have isn't appreciated by people that they would like to uh, enrich with the wisdom that they have. And so that can contribute to a, a depression. Um, and so to keep those social networks vibrant, I would recommend that. And then personally, sleep, diet, and exercise are all very important. We feel better, and there's a very interesting research out there about is exercise as effective as the antidepressant medications that we have. Mm. If we can get people moving, when you, you talk about the exercise high, you get the endorphins flowing through your, through your system, and it makes you feel good. Even if not initially, if you can stay with it for three workouts and then have it become more of a habit, you can start to feel the effects of that. Well, better exercise leads to better sleep. Right. Um, and if, when it's a higher quality sleep, if we look at the sleep profiles of depressed people, uh, they're markedly different than what we have for healthy functioning adults. And so we can start to normalize their sleep. Well, there's no substitute for good sleep, <clears throat> good healthy sleep. Um, that and then diet too. When we're depressed, we can, we can uh, few things can happen. We can start to eat less, we're not hungry, uh, we don't have the initiative we used to have, and so we're not cooking for ourselves or going out to, um, to get food. And even going out to get some food can be a social interaction. We're talking with the person preparing your food, or there's some other people online. And for a depressed person, or a, pe- or a person who's in a, um, not a full-blown depression, but a mild depressive episode, that brief interaction can be impactful. And so don't disregard or minimize just regular um, social interactions you have, saying hello to people at work, uh, checking in with them. Beautiful thing in Antigua when you hop on the bus and everyone says good morning, okay? Wonderful traditions you have here in place that can help offset some of those um, depressive things that we have. So sleep, diet, and exercise would be the, if we wanna talk in terms of prevention, that and keeping our social networks vibrant and alive. And when you have the social networks working for you, to check in on other people too. Um, And uh, it's always a blessing to ourselves and we can help someone else. And so to help visit them, um, they might not be getting out as much as they used like to or, or, (coughs) excuse me, or uh, they used to. So keep checking in on people. All those points, I see that and I see mature individuals accepting it and understanding the importance. However, what about our young boys, teenagers, young men, who know that they feel like they're, they're energetic, they have all of these wonderful things that are going, but yet still may have some mental health challenges? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's unsettling for me because the research in the United States is showing that we're seeing an increase in depression among adolescents and an increase in the suicide rate too. Why do you think that is? I think part of that is social media where uh, mental health professionals will talk about the technocratization of society. People are on their cell phones, um, they're playing a video game, but it could be with strangers around the world and they don't know the neighbor uh, down the street. They don't know the their sibling well, down the hall in the, in the next bedroom. They don't know their parents as well. And so they're, they're, they're not getting that social interaction we used to a gener- uh, before the technology revolution. And the research is showing even for depressed adolescents, if they take one week off of Facebook, they feel like they're gonna die if they do that. But if we force them to have one week off from Facebook, their depressive symptoms are less pronounced. They feel better. For adolescents, the challenge is this. Um, someone takes a picture of some remarkable event in their life. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's a big social event or something beautiful or they're on a trip or something, they post it. And they post it because it's remarkable. Now an adolescent sees that 
And they're getting this from a number of sources, including people they might emulate or idealize. And they're, they, they take the mistake of, re, of taking that extreme photo for the norm. And they start to compare their life to the extreme. And there's no way that comparison can be satisfying for them. So they keep, in their own self-evaluation, they keep falling short. Oh, I'm not traveling to that beautiful place. I'm not at this, this wedding. Look at how much fun they're having. I'm, you know, I'm not at whatever. And they keep analyzing themselves in comparison to an extreme, and they keep feeling um, insufficient and uh, like their life is lacking. And with, to help educate them that that's an unrealistic standard. And these are really remarkable events people are taking pictures of, not daily normal events. You shouldn't have that expectation in your life. And that comparison feeds into their depression and suicide. So, so because these are young people that we're referring to, what advice is, is mental health professionals or mental health professionals giving to parents to help their children to understand that no, that's a one-off, or these may be one-offs. That's not doesn't mean you're missing out on anything in life. It doesn't mean that you're less of an individual. How are they getting that point across? Okay, fabulous question, and that can be a challenge. Part of the challenge with adolescents is uh, they want to be their own person, and so for them to uh, grow into the own person they can be, they do that by separating from their parents, so it can lead to an isolation where the communication can break down. And if they, and if they haven't had a good uh, communication stream beforehand, then that can be a really stressful time. And so to try and establish and maintain good communication streams right from the time when they're little on, and then teaching the adolescents to express their emotions verbally. Adolescents, I wasn't a good communicator when I was an adolescent, and especially males raised in uh, North America were not taught to express our emotions. And when when we want to get in touch with, in uh, in touch with those feelings and then communicate them, they enrich our relationships. And that's a complaint, I've done couples counseling, so that's a common complaint with a lot of uh, women in the relationship where they're like, I don't know how he's feeling, he doesn't talk to me, uh, you know, I ask him how his day was and he says, fine, you know, and, and walks away. And there's not the sharing there. Um, if you can sit down, have a meal with your children, ask them how their day was. What was the highlight of your day? Mm -hmm. Okay, what was the hardest part of your day? Um, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up. Is there anyone in class that you're attracted to? And investigate these things. And if they, if you can continue to have normal conversations with them at a sit-down family meal, that can be the basis for a whole sharing growing up. And then us as a parent, we can model that. I had a hard work. I had a hard day at work today, and here's the challenge I had. Or I felt really thrilled with how this project came out. And so we can model for them, especially as men, how to express our emotions appropriately, so we can develop the good emotional unions that we want uh, growing up. If you now, to, it's a harder challenge when you don't have a good communication stream with a child to try and establish that as an adolescent. So if you can foster that from. Uh, from little on, that's best. And then if you have to establish it with an adolescent, talk in terms of their interests, okay? What are you enjoying the most? Or you're following this basketball team, who's your favorite player? But I'm sure you can appreciate the fact that at, here at Antigua and North America, the family dynamic is not always the ideal scenario. So to say uh, some of those things, having dinner together and so forth and so on, that may not be the norm for a family, but yet this young, this young boy or this teenage male is, has these real challenges that he's faced with. If the dynamic is not there, where's it gonna come from? Where's it gonna come from? So th then we would need to search for uh, what we generally call surrogate parents. They might be a teacher, they might be a coach, it could be a scout leader, it could be a, a minister in church, someone else to step into that life to help model for them what's appropriate. Um, Peers can help, but peers can, that's, <laughs> peers can steer them down the wrong path, right, too. Exactly. Okay, where they can say, hey, you know, have a drink here, have some rum, you'll feel all better. Um, and so, uh, yeah, to get someone to intervene there, uh, that's really critical. Emotion and expressing one's emotion. You, <laughs> you obviously have experience with this. How do you get a young man to begin to express himself? Okay, how to get a young man to express himself? Very good, because we're not, we don't have a lot of good examples of this. Or if you see, can you think of the last movie where you saw a man cry? Right. 
You know, it's it's we don't we don't have those examples. Or we see um, I follow um, American football, and so to see a young man get drafted into the NFL and watch him get that phone call and he's crying, I'm, I'm like, wow! Here's this big, strong, powerful man in the prime of his life uh, crying. This is it's a wonderful example, and and the, the TV cameras aren't backing away from it now like they used to. Right. And so they're talking about, yeah, this is a emo really emotional time for him. He's got to be very proud of everything he's all everything he's been working for up to this date, and. Uh, and then they'll go on and they'll continue the dialogue and they still have the camera on the big crying man. Um, so very interesting what I'm seeing there. And I've gotten away from your question. <laughs> uh, oh, examples? Right. Okay. Um, and so for us to model that for them, for us to talk in terms of our emotions. Uh, the highlight for my day was this. What was the highlight for your day? Uh, one of the challenges I'm facing in my life right now is, is this. And uh, what's, what's the challenge for you? Um, seems like you're doing well in school. And what's your favorite subject? And what subject you hate the least? You hate the most. You know, like the least. Um, it all, based on what you're saying, it's going to come back to that communication. And if the dynamic is missing within the family, then finding that mentor, that aunt, uncle, or to use your expression, the surrogate parent, someone else who can fill that void, mm -hmm. or other men in the community stepping up to also be that example mm -hmm. that the young, the young men may need. And then if there's a young person out here listening who doesn't have those, um, the social avenues, someone else it, that to communicate with, our own communication with ourself is impactful too, okay? Our own self-talk. And you may be aware of decision points where something happens and you, you're like, okay, how am I gonna react to this? It might be conscious, it might be unconscious. Or you might have an unconscious initial reaction, which could be more um, immediate. And then later on, you're like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have said that, or uh, I'd like to react differently to that. And so our own self-talk about, excuse me, one of my advisors was talking about, uh, when I hop in bed before I go to sleep, I want to think of the three accomplishments I had today. What are the three biggest accomplishments I had today? And to remember those as I'm falling asleep, or if you want to expand it to five. Um, those are wonderful things. Or when you wake up in the morning and sometimes our critical voice chimes in right away and says, oh, yesterday you should have done this, you know, uh, you weren't as productive as you should have been, to, to be relaxed with that. And then I can call the successes to mind and say, I did get this, this, and this done, and today I'll, I'll get to those. So to be less critical, more accepting of ourself, even if we don't have someone else to communicate with, let's be mindful of how we communicate with ourselves too because that can be impactful, even pivotal, sometimes. You've given us a lot of food for thought, um, from depression down to coping and prevention and uh, how to uh, work with our young boys and males in the, in the community. But what do we walk away from with this after this conversation? You mentioned falling asleep with three to five things. If we kept it tight and said three things, what three things would you say as men we should walk away from after listening to this program this, this evening regarding our mental health and emotional well-being? Okay. I would say the big three that come to mind for me uh, are social relationships. Mm -hmm. Keep them vibrant. Keep in touch with people. And when you have those relationships, secondly, to share your emotions. Don't be afraid to share champion moments. Okay, mm -hmm. high five moments, definitely share those. Um, don't be afraid to share challenging moments too because you may realize uh, you're not alone in this or other people want to help you and uh, they might be um, surprised with how effective that can be for you. And then I would say to monitor ourselves too. What do we have for self-talk? If we can reduce that self-criticism, that can be important. So even if we, we don't have the other people interacting with, ours, with us in our lives or it might be temporary, where we don't have uh, some of our friends have left us, or we're transitioning to a new school, or just started college or something. We have to create another social network um, to quiet and accept that self-critical voice, and to perhaps choose another thought. Powerful statement. Oh. Thank you very much for, for sharing these, this with us. I do feel that we may continue this discussion at a later date if you're open to that. Yeah, I'd welcome that. Thanks for your questions. Thank you very much. Oh, Stay welcome. with us. We'll be right back. Asthma is a fatal disease with serious consequences, especially during an asthma attack. 
Knowing what to do in this situation can be crucial to saving your life. First, when having an asthma attack, stay calm and take deep breaths while standing straight up. Second, take your reliever or rescue inhaler immediately and take one or two puffs. Continue to breathe steadily. Third, sit down and ensure any tight clothing is loosened. However, do not lie down. If there is not immediate improvement, take another one or two puffs of your reliever or rescue inhaler. If your symptoms do not improve in a few minutes, call emergency services or go to your nearest hospital. Do not wait until it's too late. Control your asthma. Do not let it control you. This message was brought to you by American University of Antigua College of Medicine Asthma League. Take care of yourselves. We thank you for spending some time with us and for allowing us to share healthy perspectives with you. Be well, Antigua and Barbuda, and may your perspective always be a healthy one. When it comes to your health, there are many options, but which do you choose? Your choice is going to be determined largely by your view on what being healthy really is. We at AUA place a high degree of importance on health and education, so we've created this program to provide you with solid information that would facilitate your decisions regarding your health. Join us for AUA's Healthy Perspectives, hosted by Vernon Solomon of the American University of Antigua.